honor, virtue, and nobility. Three words that are infused into this treatise, published in 1624, by the prolific English writer, poet, Latin scholar, and soldier Gervais Markham. In it, he's honouring, among others, the two earls of Oxford and Southampton, main subjects of the engraving we just decoded, which states, none too subtly, that they are the rightful heirs to England's throne. He links them together with Robert, third earl of Essex, whose father was strongly suspected of being yet another unacknowledged son of Queen Elizabeth. It describes itself as a treatise in commendations of the virtues and renowned virtuous undertakings, note how the word is broken there at kings, of the illustrious and heroical princes, which also breaks at heroical princes. We're going to see much more of this printing wordplay. This is by no means an anomaly. Now, near the bottom of the treatise is a Latin quote from the beginning of Virgil's epic poem, the Aeneid. But this quote is very noticeably not the actual start of the Aeneid, because Virgil uncharacteristically starts with three lines referencing previous works of his. His pastoral work, the Eclogues, which has echoes of Adam and Eve's son Abel, the shepherd, and his agricultural poem, the Georgic, which has echoes of his brother Cain, the farmer who murders Abel. Only after this strange false start does Virgil get into the Aeneid proper with the quote Markham highlights. Those first lines translated read, I am the man who once tuned his song on a slender reed, that's Abel, the shepherd who traditionally plays a flute, and on leaving the woods, forced the neighboring fields to obey the husbandman, however greedy, a work pleasing to farmers. And, and that's Cain, of course, the farmer who murdered Abel out of greed and jealousy for God's favor. And only then do we get Markham's Virgil quote, but now of Mars's bristling arms and the man I sing. And it continues, who first from the shores of Troy, an exile through fate, came to Italy and the Lavinian shores. And that's both Cain and his son Enoch, of course. Because Cain is exiled to wander in the land of Nod as punishment for his sin of committing the first murder. But then Genesis is a little vague. Either Cain built a city and named it after Enoch, or else Enoch built a city. But either way, it's clear that Cain and Enoch, both exiled, are echoed in Aeneas because both the Aeneid and Genesis are describing the same metaphor. The once pristine, invincible Troy, Eden, has become corrupted by the eating of the Tree of Knowledge, symbolized, I hate to say it in such old patriarchal terms, but it's the language used by both the Bible and the Aeneid. The Tree of Knowledge is symbolized by the wantonness of Helen, who was equated with Eve in medieval times. Aeneas and Helen leave Troy, burning, Adam and Eve leave Eden, driven out by a flaming sword, and must venture forth to build a new home, a new city-state. Now, I'm explaining these biblical historical parallels because this is a central theme echoed throughout Shakespeare's works. As feudal and monarchy-driven as they are, there's nevertheless a tacit acknowledgement of the deep dysfunctionality of the system he's a product of. For God's sake... Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antics sits, scoffing his state, grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable, and humoured thus comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king. Markham's honour uncomfortably reflects this in its glorification of war and the plundering of other states for Britannia's benefit. But the clear purpose of its text, as you're about to see, is to direct us to an even deeper decoding of Vischer's masterpiece engraving. 
So let's have a close look at what Markham is saying. He starts out by honouring the eternal memory of the four illustrious houses of Oxford, Southampton, Essex and Willoughby, and to all the living branches, males and females, Note the language echoing the spur reference that we saw on the engraving. Branches, goodly cedars, have I by the spurs plucked up the pine and the cedar? Mingle their spurs together. As you can see, he uses the word honour over and over again. And as we reach the area where he begins to talk about Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, I want to give a shout out to Heidi Jansch for excellent work on her Hidden Epitaph blog where she points out that this numbering system seems to be mapped to the two Earls de Vere rankings within the House of Oxford. I personally think it's significant that Edward straddles pages 16 and 17, as I've noted the 1617 cusp in so many places, and that's really a subject to be explored in another video. Edward's section ends with Markham saying he was honest, pious, and magnanimous. But his section is notably brief, barely a page, because to keep the narrative chronological, he has to squeeze in a mention of his cousins, Sir Francis and Sir Horace Vere, as quickly as possible before reaching Henry the Eighteenth Earl, who must appear, of course, on page 18. And even less than a page is devoted to Henry, ending with a prophecy that he will be the right arm to the body which shall bring back again to the royal owner the now wasted Palatinate. Because, you see, that's the forceful message behind Markham's treatise, to say that these four families are the right men to return the Palatinate, recently lost by the defeat of King James's son-in-law, King Frederick V, to its rightful royal owner. It's very strange because on one level, this is a jingoistic rallying cry, a, a propagandist go get em, Henrys and Bobbies. And yet, as you're about to discover, its hidden purpose is to confirm the treasonous truth of vicious engraving, whilst revealing an even deeper truth inextricably linked to the mystery of the Shakespeare subterfuge. In one paragraph, he covers the whole history of the entire male lineage of 18 Earls Vere from Aubrey in the time of William the Conqueror, which, as he says, is honour almost as early as could be. And thus he gets to start on the House of Southampton, just in time to conceal and reveal a brilliant numerological denouement. Remember, we just went through this in the grid code of the engraving. Brothers cut out of the original priore father lineage to be Henry X, which showed that after King Henry's the seventh and eighth, the only way for there to possibly be a Henry IX and a Henry X is if Henry Rosley was the son of the Queen and Edward de Vere, and thus was the real 18th Earl and the true King Henry IX. As a consequence, the recognised Henry the Eighteenth Earl was really the Nineteenth Earl and King Henry X. Note the precise placement of the catchword King. And now the numbers have run their course for Markham, so he can be more leisurely in telling Henry Rosley's story, ostensibly the Third Earl of Southampton. He gives him almost five pages, but still manages to work out another catchword hint, King, this time by needlessly splitting the word taking. Again, Mark amends Rosely's story with a plug for him being the eyes and conduct to lead the restitution of the lost Palatinate, for therein consists my prophecy. But is that really the reason he's writing this? This was published in 1624, remember? They're already out there fighting, unsuccessfully as it happens. Let's scroll back for a moment. Roger Stripmatter, commenting on Heidi Jansch's observations in her blog, noted a chiasmus, a reversal of grammatical structure, that's clearly a direct reference to an underlined passage in Edward de Vere's Geneva Bible. Markham says the arms he gave are trumpets so loud that all ears know them, and this is, of course, a reversal of the biblical passage. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, 
that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. This is Matthew 6 to 4. And just across the page, we have a section that I identified about three years ago as a, as a 624 code. It starts with the line, Veer cannot be omitted, and ends, Veer should ever be included within. And those of you who realize the significance of the 624 codes and John Dee's Enochian tables know that this takes us back to the absolute basis of all of the Shakespeare subterfuge. And so we should not be surprised when we see these lines, one pretty secret or mystery, the mistaking of names, and then he goes into a really curious area, make one name to contain another, as the name Adam to contain the name Eva also, and the word man to contain the word woman also. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that this is referencing us back to Virgil's Ennead, which is referencing Adam and Eve and their children Abel and Cain. And yet, what is he really doing here? It's a puzzle. These are actually very precise instructions as to how to play a word game. The name Adam to contain the name Eva also. Adam itself does not contain the name Eva, only name Adam does. Note he has to say Eva, not Eve, because name Adam does not contain Eve. You can only create this by turning the N upside down, which is a typical Rosicrucian ploy of inversion, to create a U, which is a V substitute, to give us Eva. And now it's simplicity itself. We see he's done the same thing with word man to contain the word woman. All this to tell us there is one pretty secret or mystery which I cannot let pass untouched because it brings many difficulties or doubts into the mind of an ignorant reader, and that is the mistaking of names. And then he gives us precise instructions to tell us exactly how to solve this pretty secret or mystery. He says we might see the name of Nassau or the Dutch and such like. What does this mean? Well, there's a Countess Louise Juliana of Nassau, and her father is Count Nassau Dillenberg, otherwise known as William the Silent. And they are the mother and grandfather of Frederick V. So what are these clues pointing us to? Let's have a look at the title page again. Printed by B. Alsop for Benjamin Fisher. You remember the Fisher print shop in Amsterdam? But this is in London. Benjamin Fisher. Make one name to contain another. You see, it contains Jan Fisher. Hmm. With a little Latin word left over, enim. What does that mean? It means, in fact, indeed, namely. Taken at face value, it sure looks like this is confirmation that Fisher did the engraving. What else do we have? Paternoster Row. Peter Noster is the Our Father, the very basis of the battle between the Catholics and the Reformists. Catholics insist we must sing it in Latin. The Reformists are saying, no, it should be available to everybody to be spoken in just plain English. But this clue goes much deeper because Count Nassau Dillenberg was the start of the revolution. Fifty years of war, even before the Thirty Years' War. He was the first of the reformists to engage the Habsburgs, and so revered by the Dutch for his efforts, they called him the Father of the Fatherland. His name is the very epitome itself of the Our Father. Yet it goes deeper because, again, make one name to contain another. The Paternoster had become emblematic of the whole row between the reformists and the Catholics, a central tenet of belief differences that became a full-fledged Thirty Years' War. And yet we see the pattern here in the name it contains. Rose Tau, Rose Cross, the symbol of the Rosicrucians, whose origins and teachings are described in three anonymously published books from 1614 to 1616, attributed to the Lutheran theologian Johann Valentin Andrea, 
The third of these, The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, tells of an initiatory journey taken by Rosenkreutz during which he is made a knight of the Golden Stone. It's hard to conceive that the two mysterious characters in Hamlet, Rosenkrantz and Guildenstern, who appear out of nowhere, are really anything but a thinly veiled reference to Rosenkreutz and the Golden Stone knighthood, confirming at least Shakespeare's deep interest, if not membership, in the secret order of the Rosicrucians. Some Rosicross scholars today believe Rosenkreutz to be a pseudonym for Sir Francis Bacon, and so the mystery compounds layer upon layer, because the fraternity's founders referred to Rosenkreutz as our Christian father, Peter Rosenkreutz, Rosencross. What's next? Talbot, Shakespeare's epitome of a feared warrior, but again, make one name to contain another. Battle? Well, it's not going to make any sense until we look at the fourth person that Markham has dedicated this treatise to, up here. Robert Bartu, which is very interesting because no such person exists. And this is another enormous clue because the person who it really is is Robert Bertie, nephew of Edward de Vere, son of Peregrine Bertie who married Mary de Vere, daughter of 16th Earl of Oxford John. The Berties are well known. Their lineage goes back from about 1450 all the way through to 1780. And not a single one of them was a bar two. So what is going on here? <laughs> this is pretty conclusive proof that just like the engraving, this was never intended to come out publicly or it would have been known to be an enormous mistake. Why would you do that unless it's part of the game, the mistaking of names? And make one name to contain another. Bar two becomes Batory, which will soon make sense, along with Bato, once we see what's really going on with the engraving. The name here is Gabriel Bator, and it's wrong. I'll lighten it up so you can see it. Gabriel Bator, why? Just in case you were solving it from the other direction, it contains the word Talbot. Redundancy has been built into all these clues because the Rosicrucians want to make sure you see it. And the astute observer will realize this is not Gabriel Bator, this is Gabriel Bethlen. This guy is Gabriel Bator. This is another picture of Gabriel Bethlen, clearly our man in the picture. So why this mistaking of names? Why put in this Gabriel Bator? He's a real person. But his name is not actually even Bator. His true name is Gabriel Batori. And now we see the meaning of the clue of Baturi, which is really Bartu, which is really Bertie, the mistaken name in the honor in his perfection all the way back in England to connect to this engraving in Holland. <laughs> it's crazy, but it's there. Why? Well, if we look at the letters he got right, the Gabriel and the B and the T, I'll just fade those out and let's have a look at what he left for clues for us to make one name to contain another in this mistaking of names. <laughs> well, it's almost unbelievable, isn't it? Helen. Ah, uh, Troy. Ah uh, is Latin for of. Are you dumbfounded yet? In the early Middle Ages, after the rise of Christianity, Helen was seen as a pagan equivalent to Eve in the book of Genesis. However, she was also beloved by many early medieval Christians, so much so that she became associated with the Virgin Mary, as did Queen Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. In Hellenistic times, she was also associated with the moon due to the similarity of her name to the Greek word Selen, meaning moon, or goddess of the moon, as was Queen Elizabeth I, associated with Diana, goddess of the moon. So we have Helen, associated with Diana. We have Queen Elizabeth, associated with Diana. Helen also is associated with Athena, because Helen is a daughter of Zeus, as is Athena, the spear shaker. They're sisters. But the Roman equivalent of Athena is Minerva, and our English Minerva, Minerva Britanna, was 
this spear shaker. Why are we being led by the hand almost every step of the way to see all these connections? You can't really think of Helen of Troy without thinking of the horse. Think of the greatest military victory of all time. You think of Troy and the horse. Think of the greatest story of all time and you think of the Enneid and perhaps its companions, the Odyssey and the Iliad. But modern writers think of the Enneid as the most masterful story of all time. And what is it really? Think about it. In all of literary history, it stands alone as the greatest, most successful deception of all time. It embodies the metaphor of leaving the old behind and having to move on to the new Eden, Troy, Rome, Britain, America. But above all, it embodies this masterful idea of a great deception to bring about a necessary change. The horse is rolled inside the city gates of Troy. Odysseus and a couple of dozen of his men are secreted inside, and come night time, when they hear that everyone is asleep or drunk, they descend and burn Troy to the ground. History records this occurred on the morning of April 24, which means that the great deception of the horse arriving in their midst occurred on April 23rd, the official birthday of Shakespeare. Who on earth is writing this? Act 3. Eternal numbers to outlive long.